okay, this is probably the part that I find the most disgusting of this entire presentation than this man that now has... I have zero respect for this man. Zero. No. Specifically because of what he said right now. He knows what he's saying is nonsense and he's saying it in front of a camera and he's probably worried that someone like me will call it out. Well, here I am, professor. Hello noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking and as you could tell today we are reviewing and reacting to a video which was published on the channel Vanity Fair and it's titled Mythology Experts Reviews Greek and Roman Mythology in Movies. Now since I have pretty passion for both anything Rome and Greek, we're gonna have a look at this and make sure that it's <sighs> accurate. Hello, my name is Peter Meinek. I'm Professor of Classics in the Modern World at New York University. And today we're going to be breaking down Greek and Roman mythology in TV and film. Okay, well, if already the fact that he's a professor teaching at New York University, well, he's a professor, so I'm hoping to see some historical accuracy and most importantly, academic neutrality and no politics, right? No politics. It's really quite racist, actually. Conquer their sexuality, white supremacy, Yes, my lady. Ah, the 300. Where to start? A compelling movie and also a deeply problematical movie as well. The famous phrase, right? Come back. So here's the part. I wonder what's problematic about the movie from your point of view. From my point of view, I did make a video many, many years ago on the fact that, you know, the Spartans being very professional at war and anything warlike, then the fact that they are represented as bodybuilders and who are basically fa fighting nude, almost, was always a bit of a problem for me indeed, since the Spartans would have been the most armored of all the Greeks. I wonder if that's what you consider to be problematic, Professor. Uh, carrying your shield or laying on it, which seems a pretty harsh thing for your wife to tell you when you're about to go and fight a battle and you know you're not coming home. I think it's Pausanias who actually documents this. He said that Spartan mothers actually said it to their sons, which is perhaps even harsher. It's not only a Spartan sentiment. Um, the Athenians had a, a term of insult called a shield dropper. Anybody who dropped their shield in battle meant that they were retreating from the hoplite phalanx. The hoplite phalanx was that you would deploy your infantry, maybe six to nine thousand of them, and you would carry a large round shield called a hoplite, we see it in the movie, and that would cover... Called a hoplite, the shield. Already I think we have a little bit of a problem here because the word he's using is actually the plural form, which means hope lights. So he's basically just saying the, the Greek word oblite. He's using the word that means just means hope lights. So the actual soldiers, which could be literally translated as armed, that's not the word for the shield. The shield could be translated as aspis, oplon in some sources, although then again, oplon could also be translated depending on what source you're reading more as armament. But in general, oplon, aspis, not oblite. That already is kind of confusing from a professor. Cover half of your body, but it would also cover half of the body of the man to your left. So you were totally dependent on each other in battle. If you dropped your shield, it meant that not only were you a coward because you were running away, but you were also letting the line down. He doesn't say it. Oh yeah, yeah, apart from the, from the Greek problem <laughs> that we had for a moment, what he said apart from that was fine, so great. Only the hard and strong may call themselves Spartans. I think what's so interesting about Spartan culture is we are fascinated with it, right? Because it seems to promote this idea of kind of male toughness. But actually that's a little bit of a very repressive state to live in where everything is about the army. At the time this happens in Spartan history, the 7th, 6th century BC, all Spartan art stops, all Spartan poetry stops, and we just have this Spartan military. Spartan culture itself died out because they simply didn't produce enough children. Even though you were married, you stayed living in barracks until you were 30 years old. Men and women were, were pretty separate uh, in that society. Their marriage system just did not work. And also, they were a very, very exclusive society. You could only be a Spartan if you were born in the five villages of Sparta by... Well, similarly, in Athenian, in Athenian society, uh, you could only be a citizen if you were born in Athens, so not necessarily specific to Sparta, but I suppose. By the fourth century, Sparta was, was spent as a power. So, you know, historic... By the fourth century, Sparta was spent as a power? It's probably why a, a, a 
mythology experts should really talk about history, I suppose. Let me respond to that. Without dismissing the issues inherent to Spartan culture that have been listed, such a statement as by the 4th century Sparta was spent as a power clashes with everything we know. In 404 BC, Sparta emerged victorious from the Peloponnesian War that had pitted it against Athens, inaugurating what historians define as the Spartan hegemony in Greece, which lasted throughout the first quarter of the 4th century BC and beyond, only shattering in 371 BC with a defeat at Leuctra against the Thebans. Which is why I counter that statement and I find it incorrect. Let's continue. Historically, Spartan's system was not successful at all, so it's probably not something we should emulate. I mean, I was, I was so shocked to see people on January the 6th um, attacking the capital, dressing up as Spartans and running around. And, you know, should think about, right, is that this was perhaps the greatest gay army that's ever been on the planet. The greatest gay army that's ever been on the planet. Famous. All right, yeah, I think. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, already defining the Spartan army as the, the greatest gay army on the planet is clearly amusing, if you will, but at the end of the day, it's still nonsense. We have already talked hundreds of times on this channel how the sexuality of the ancients is not superimposable on modern sexuality. Also remembering that sexuality in the classical period followed specific norms and rules. For example, the fact that passive homosexuality tended to be stigmatized. So already the statement you're making here, you're making it because you're trying to put in, to inject politics into this show that it's just asking you to talk about the mythology. But let's continue, maybe he will get better. Famously bisexual, as many people were in, in um, antiquity, had very different ideas about sexuality. They lived... Um... That's the only thing I agree. Very different ideas of sexuality to how we experience and live sexuality in our day and age. Not to mention not everything is about sexuality. But in general, to say that many people were bisexual, you need to bring in the data. But I, I don't want to go too deeply into this because I've already spoken it. At, I'll put some links in the description for the details. Together as men in messes and the Spartans were uh, very much um, into each other, great bisexual army in many ways. That's another way that they've been sort of misinterpreted that somehow they convey this kind of idea of, you know, certain masculinity. That is not attested at all in the ancient sources. But having said that is absolutely attested in the ancient sources. You are completely wrong. <laughs> Where do I even begin? First of all, the only thing I will say is that even though tough, strong masculinity is absolutely present if one reads the sources, of course I'll prove it to you, I'll give you some examples, but it is also important to be nuanced about this in the sense that, once again, in period, you could still be considered a virile masculine man even if you were having homoerotic intercourse or homosexual relationships as long as you were the active part and as long as the as you were the highest in rank. So masculinity as a concept is not exactly the same as the way we consider masculinity today. With that being said, this idea that he's mentioning of a tough, rough man, he says is not present in period sources specifically in connection with the Spartan, that is absurd. And here is why. The masculinity expressed by Spartan culture was a mixture of frankness, roughness, simplicity, frugality, remains evident in the sources. Here are some examples. Philip II of Macedonia said, If I enter Laconia, I will raise it to the ground. The Spartans replied, If. A Spartan responds during an initiation rite to a priest who asks him the most nefarious action he had ever committed. The Spartan says, To whom should I confess it? To you or to God? The priest says, To God. Then the Spartan says, Then get out of here. Example 3. A Spartan is asked if the roads leading to Sparta are safe. The answer given by the Spartan is the following. It depends on what you are. While the lions with us roam wherever they want, their hairs end up in the pot. Example 4. An orator makes a speech with very long sentences and a Spartan commends, Wow, what courage this man possesses, how skilled he is in wrapping his tongue around emptiness. So, as you can see, even from a modern perspective, if we read these, the first thing that comes to mind is they do give the example of a very masculine, rough and tough person who is representing the Spartan in the eyes of the ancients, even for us. Let's continue. This scene is from the movie Black Panther. Millions. Let me guess, you love this movie. I know this guy 
is gonna absolutely adore the movie Black Panther. Of years ago, a meteorite made of vibranium, the strongest substance in the universe, struck the continent of Africa, Wakanda. The first thing to say is that the Mediterranean world doesn't exist in isolation. And one of the things that has, has happened is that Greek and Roman mythology has somehow been disconnected, mainly in the 19th century by Europeans. And, you know, to a certain extent, whitewashed, right? Taken away from... Yeah, those horrible Europeans, right? And uh, whitewashed. We whitewashed Greek and Roman <laughs> mythology. I, I have no idea what he's on about, but let's see. Oh, is he going to say that the Greek and, and Roman gods that actually originated in Africa? Is he one of those, like, did he read the book Black Athena? Is that what this is all about? From its Mediterranean roots. And, you know, half of the Mediterranean is Africa, right? And we forget that. And No, only people who don't know geography forget that. The Greeks had a very different attitude to Africa, and that was they saw Ethiopia, Egypt, Kush, Kerma as uh, very ancient and very advanced cultures and civilizations. And we see this reflected here in Black Panther. So, for example, in book one of the Iliad, the gods are not on Olympus. They've actually gone to the only humans who they deign worthy of their company to dine with, and that is the Ethiopians. And then secondly, a lot of what we call Greek mythology are heavily influenced by stories from Africa via Egypt and Kush. I don't think there would be Greek and Roman mythology without these, these ancient African stories. It's absolutely nonsensical to say that there would be no Greek and Roman mythology without Africa and its mythology. Now, don't get me wrong, I find, personally, I find African mythology, African history, African culture, African civilization, African geography, I find it absolutely fascinating, which is why I do talk about it on this channel. I don't just talk about Rome and Greece and, and all that and European Middle Ages, I like talking about Japan, I like talking about China. I am interested in the majority of mythologies in the world and absolutely there is very much to say. For instance, on this video here, on the second part, I talk about the Kandake, so the uh, famous most black queens, warrior queens in Africa. So don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that that mythology isn't its own interesting field of studies, but a statement from someone who is an expert in Roman and Greek mythology saying that it wouldn't exist without Africa, it's nonsense. Absolutely nonsense. For instance, Bernal in the book Black Athena, which is a text that needs to be taken with a grain of salt, but it is rich in interesting suggestions, rightly emphasizes the points of contact and cultural connections the Greek myths have towards Egypt and the Near East. But looking for connection with Black Panther and Central Africa is absurd. How can I help you? I'm just checking out these artifacts. They tell me you're the expert. Ah, uh, you could say that. Where is this one from? The Bobo Ashanti tribe, present day Ghana, 19th century. To take that mask and put it in a glass case in a museum is the worst thing you can do to that mask. That mask is supposed to be worn by a performer who's been imbued in a whole culture of dancing and performing and telling those stories over centuries. And now it's become like an aesthetic object with a price on it. And I think this movie actually shows that really well. Also from Benin, 7th century, <clears throat> Fula tribe, I believe. Nah. I beg your pardon. It was taken by British soldiers in Benin but it's from Wakanda, and it's made out of vibranium. Don't trip, I'm gonna take it off your hands for you. These items aren't for sale. How do you think your ancestors got these? You think they paid a fair price? Or did they take it like they took everything else? Here's a character from that culture who's not really allowed to interface with material from his own culture and is, is actually being schooled on it by somebody who's not from that culture. It's about access, right? And I think one of the- Okay, this is probably the part that I find the most disgusting of this entire presentation than this man that now has... I have zero respect for this man. Zero. No. Specifically because of what he said right now. So notice how he's opposing the fact that there is a, a black man who has been schooled, like he says, by a white person, because there's someone who's not from that culture, by a white archaeologist, professor, whatever she is, about items of the culture that belongs to that black man. And he says that that is wrong. You absolute Professor, how do you not see that that is exactly what you are doing? You are a white man, you are not from Africa, and yet you're schooling the people who are watching you through to YouTube, and I can assure you there are black people from Africa that are watching your lecture right now. You are schooling them as a white man about how these masks were used in their 
culture. At certain festivals, they would wear the masks of their ancestors and they would parade through the streets in them. How do you not see the hypocrisy in condemning something that you are doing right now in front of everyone to see? You see, the problem with that, Professor, is that your whole approach is racist because you are focusing on where a person is from, most likely their skin, in order to legitimate their ability to teach other people about a specific culture. Now, the reason why that is the definition of racism is because, on the contrary, I'm an Italian, okay? So, if a black professor, so someone who is African, or African-American, or whatever, if this person has gone to university, has a degree, they're very knowledgeable, he's an archaeologist, he's got a PhD on Roman history. Does the simple fact that I'm an Italian forget that I actually did study Roman history, pretend I didn't? Does that mean that he's not allowed to talk to me and teach me that? Of course he can, because I don't look at the skin. The skin matters nothing. His culture matters nothing. What really matters is what his level of academic preparation. So likewise, if a white person is an archaeologist, professor and what have you, and you know, there is a black kid and this kid perhaps hasn't studied the history of Africa, because not everyone does, it's fine for the white professor to teach the black kid. Now, I do understand that due to racism that did occur, unfortunately, was also part of archaeology in Europe and in general in the world, in America, this could be, to you, it would immediately become a problematic image. But the reality of fact is that if we really shun ourselves of all forms of racism and we want to seriously face racism and attack it, then we need to remove all of these ideas and stop looking at, well, wait a second, what is the skin color of the person who is teaching and what is the skin color or the culture of the ethnicity of the person who is being taught? We need to stop looking at that and we need to look at their level of preparation in that specific field. Nothing else matters. They can be black, white, red, green, blue. It can be, I would be so thrilled to be taught European history and Middle Ages by a Native American if <laughs> said Native American has had training and he knows what he's talking about. What does it matter? This is so obvious and the level of hypocrisy in this sort of political positioning that this person has and that he's allowing to infect his teaching. I imagine that if this is if this is what he's teaching here. This is what he's teaching at university and it's infected by politics. This isn't academic neutrality. Things this does is it shows us how if you remove an object from the stories that are told about it and the way it's performed, is that object still operating the same way? If you appreciate my content so far and wish to help ensure my ability to continue to tell it how it is, regardless of any possible backlash, please support this channel on Patreon. Any support helps me and my team of academics keep the channel strong and gives us the means to fight back against the political political rewriting of history. Stand with us, form the wall, defend the truth. Having said that, I think they get certain things right, okay? There's no doubt Spartan warriors, all Greek warriors, were very interested in physical fitness. They were very interested in the male body. They were often depicted nude um, in Greek art. And the women too had to undergo physical exercise in order to give strong babies for the Spartan army. They did wear red cloaks as a way to kind of soak up the blood on the battlefield, but also to designate themselves that they were Spartans. And it was considered manly to have a very long beard. One of the things I really don't like about this movie, The 300, is the way that the Persians are presented. They're almost non-human twisted and as kind of vile and to me it's really quite racist actually it's really quite racist actually and it's of course to you it's racist and this is not going to be the first time we hear the word racist i assure you racist i'm surprised we haven't heard any other accusation like white supremacy and whatnot but racist there we go so is it a racist representation of the Persians. Well, certainly 300 represents the Persians in a caricatured way, emphasizing the Persian softness, but I wouldn't call it racism. The film is based on the graphic novel by Frank Miller, who, as in his other works, for example The Dark Knight Returns, employs a very particular form of social satire, and if read in depth, he's an author who loves to put forth great contradictions. This is a key word, keep it in mind, contradictions. 
In fact, Miller does not describe the Spartans in a positive way, but plays with a narrative according to which, at a given moment, their contribution was incisive in defending Greece, and therefore also Athenian democracy, from the aims of an autocratic state such as the Persian Empire. In other words, the Spartans were strange catalysts of democracy if you were to consider them fascists. In other words, the contrast that I think the author is playing with here is that yes, the Athenians created democracy, but the Spartans, by defending Greece, made it possible. It's, it's kind of promoting white supremacy versus this horrible kind of invasion of, of brown people, and it's completely inaccurate. I mean, one of the things about the Persian Empire that even the Greeks tell is how multi-ethnic it was and how it had people from all over the world in their army. And the battle tactics of the great king was he would literally turn up with his million-man army. I just knew it. That he was gonna say white. After they say racist, I'm like, okay, so they said racist. We still have a few boxes to check, one of which is white supremacy. I'll tell you why that's nonsense in a second. Army, and you just surrendered, right? Because how could you possibly take an army like that on? But you don't see these kind of racist and xenophobic attitudes in the Greek texts. If Aeschylus, who fought at the Battle of Marathon and lost a brother there, he was a playwright and he also served in the military, he actually wrote a play called The Persians and we actually feel sympathy for the Persians in their defeat and, and we feel their pain and we feel the losses that's, that's happened to them. And I think this is the thing that really makes him uncomfortable about this film. There is they were, they're still the invaders though, just, just so you know. Anyways, I do have a thing or two to say about that. Regarding the representation of Persian softness in contrast to the virility of the Greek warriors, however, the classical sources themselves tell us about it, contrary to what this professor is saying. We read, Since the sight of the Persians inspired terror in Agesilaus' troops, he ordered his Persian prisoners to be stripped and their white soft bodies, contemptuous to Greeks, to be displayed to his men. So that to me looks quite xenophobic, although you might disagree I suppose, but what's important to say is that, so what do they mean by white bodies? Well in ancient Greece there was this idea that even though an ancient Greek would have looked very much like a Mediterranean person, still because because they were warriors, there were people that worked the field, they would have been tanned. And in ancient Greek uh, culture and languages, when you were too white, it meant that you weren't a warrior. It meant because you, were, you weren't tanning, you were just staying inside. And therefore, there was sort of a negative connection uh, when people were not tanned, in a way. And this is what's being expressed here when they talk about the Persians. And you can find numerous mentions about the Persians that are in fact quite xenophobic but he's, of course, cherry-picking. There is such a rope, good king! Just past that western ridge! Oh, right, now we see the, the deformed guy. He's definitely gonna let, watch him say ableists. Watch him say ableists. Ridge. It's an old goat path. The Persians could use it to outflank us. Not one step closer. Monster! There actually is accounts of a character like that and a kind of rejected Spartan character who does actually go over to the enemy. He's certainly nowhere near as deformed as, as this character. Not a Spartan. I mean, I'll wait, I'll, I'll let him finish, but not a Spartan. Character. And again, that's also kind of very problematic, right? There's, there's a connection between physical perfection, beauty and loyalty and truth. Because this character doesn't fit that ideal, he has to be deceitful. This is actually the opposite of what you find in Greek mythology. Characters like that. Utter nonsense. Now he's straight up lying. I'll, of course, prove it to you with the sources in a moment. I'll let him finish. Are often given a second sight. One can think of Tiresias, who has lived as both a man and a woman and who is blind. Characters like Oedipus, who is depicted as, as having a leg deformity. Characters who we would label perhaps as disabled, who actually are seen as having great high status in Greek society. So again, this is something that the movie, I think, gets gets very wrong. And I see he's getting like, he's, he's fibbling a lot with his hands and he's stuttering because he knows, he must have read the sources, I hope. He knows what he's saying is nonsense and he's saying it in front of a camera and he's probably worried that someone like me will call it out. Well, here I am, professor. Now, it's been a while since I watched the movie and I don't remember exactly how you pronounce the name of this, the, the, the deformed character, is it like, 
Ephialtes, 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 I don't remember so you'll have to excuse me for that. But in general the character is present in the graphic novel, but it's very constructed in the sense that the sources do not speak of a deformed character, but only of the fact that he is a traitor. Moreover, however, the traitor in question was not a Spartan, but he was a local shepherd, contrary to what the professor stated. Furthermore, Millis' representation, which is represented in Snyder's film, the idea of a deformed traitor is actually absolutely coherent from an anthropological and mythical standpoint with the Greek ideal of beautiful and good, a stylistic device according to which moral rectitude had to be mirrored by physical perfection. Deformed character is actually a transposition of Homer's Thersites, who wants to push the Achaeans to abandon the siege of Troy and return home. He is the representation of negativity, cowardice and stupidity, and not by chance in the Iliad he is beaten and humiliated by Odysseus, who is a representation of reason. In other words, to make the negativity of the character evident, Homer himself represents him as deformed and horrible to see, according to the stylistic device that we just mentioned of rectitude and beauty, of beautiful and good. So the fact that he says that such a concept is not present in the sources when it's freaking Homer that uses it is absurd to me. But of course I don't want to just believe me, I'm gonna read you the source now. Thersites still went on wogging his unbridled tongue, a man of many words, and those unseemly, a monger of sedition, a railer against all who were in authority, who cared not what he said so that he might set the Achaeans in a laugh. He was the ugliest man of all those that came before Troy, bandy leg, lame of one foot, with his two shoulders rounded and hunched over his chest. His head ran up to a point, but there was little hair on top of it. Iliad 2, 200. Thus, even though this character in question has been in fact fabricated for this story of the movie 300, the way he is represented and the connection between an ugly man or a deformed person and evil or treason is absolutely present in the concepts and the minds of the Greeks and their literary devices. So the fact that you are saying that that's not the case is a full-on lie. This next clip is from The Clash of the Titans. I'll go out and watch this movie, looks fun. Medusa, the Gorgon who could turn you to stone. And Perseus here, one of his kind of rites as passage, his sort of step into manhood, is to go and bring back the head of Medusa and get rid of this horrible chthonic symbol. What I mean by chthonic is a symbol of the earth. So the Greeks sort of divided up their universe in terms of Olympian, which was the sky, which is predominantly controlled by Zeus and male gods, and the earth, which was predominantly female, Gaia, Hera, uh, Rhea, and one of the clues to that is whenever we see snakes, we're dealing with a, a chthonic image. And we see that in the hairstyle of Medusa, right, who's got these chthonic images of the snake. And why did the Greeks regard the snakes as chthonic? Because I think if you go to Greece and, and you see a snake, right, they seem to come out of the earth and disappear back into the earth. They're pretty scary snakes as well. So that image is very much still with us today. If any of you ever, ever go into a medical facility or ride an ambulance, you'll see a snake wrapped around a staff, right? And that is literally the chthonic symbol of death, the snake being lifted up off the ground, off the earth. Often these are myths of gender wars between male and female figures. Hold on a minute, did you just call it gender wars and then you said male and female? Be careful because you might lose your uh, teaching position in New York. And so here's Perseus, right? He's, you know, 17, 18 years old. In, in becoming a man, he has to go and literally kind of sever himself off from the world of women. So this is very much a story of a young warrior's rite of passage. The lead back mirror that we're used to seeing today was not invented until maybe the 15th century in Europe. So they never saw true reflections of themselves. They had to look at themselves in polished surfaces, bronze shields, maybe in the water. So they constantly saw reflections of themselves. <laughs> But yeah. So the shield, the, the sort of culminating moment of him looking in the mirror back at Medusa is also, I think, a kind of musing on this idea of identity, right? Do you really know who you are? And that in... Why are you projecting identity ideas, do you know who you are, into ancient Greece? Absolutely ludicrous. 
What's next? Is it sexist for him to kill Medusa? Is it because he's misogynistic? Is that a misogynistic act? That's what I'm gonna. That's what I'm expecting now. Enables him to have the power to deliver the fatal blow and sever the head. We get a lot of these stories of young men having to kind of conquer their sexuality. So the idea that a beautiful woman can petrify you obviously has sexual connotations and you've got to- I think everything has sexual connotation from your point of view. I mean, what does a sword represent? What's a sword going back into the scabbard represent? I mean, this guy, I am sure, is gonna tell me that these headphones have a sexual connotation and it's a symbol of misogyny and sexism. Goodness gracious, man. To kind of defeat that by not actually looking at it and focusing on what your mission is in order to sort of conquer your sexuality and resist the charms of women. That's You need to conquer your sexuality and resist the charms of women? All of this from the idea of killing a monster? I mean, this is ridiculous. I don't know how many times I'm going to say that word, but, you know, expect it because I think this is going to get worse. Definitely something that we find in a lot of Greek mythology and that may be playing into the Medusa myth as well. A warrior shaman received a vision from the panther goddess Bust. The warrior became king and the first black panther, the protector of Wakanda. So the idea of the panther god and then having a mortal who becomes the panther at certain moments to protect his community relates directly, if you think about it, with Heracles, right? Because Heracles is a lion warrior, I should say. And we call this therianthropy, where a human transforms into an animal to do something superhuman, and you tap into the power of that animal in, in order to protect your community. So we should place Heracles very much in the same world as that. The Wakandans you No, we should not. Heracles' relationship with the skin of the Nemean lion that he wears is absolutely not linked to therianthropy. Unlike, for example, the berserkers of the Scandinavian world, Heracles does not acquire characteristics of the beast, and above all, the figure of the hero is not linked to African myths. If anything, it is linked to Near Eastern ones. The first depictions of a hero with bow, arrows, club, and iron skin are Cypriots, so from Cyprus, and relate to the Phoenician deity of travel called Melkart, who not by chance the classics recognize in Heracles and from whom the Greek hero probably originates. In turn, in turn Melkart is probably a transposition of Ninurta Ningirsu, an Akkadian and even earlier Sumerian demigod who has bow and club among his prerogatives and is remembered as a great monster hunter. ...used vibranium to develop technology more advanced than any other nation. The Wakandans vowed to hide in plain sight. One thing I love about this movie is this idea that Wakanda's hidden. You've got this incredibly developed ancient culture. And a lot of people responded to that with this movie because that is the truth. Just like Wakanda is hidden, so- Hold on a minute, Wakanda is the truth? I understand you're a professor of mythology, but I think you're getting reality confused. Well, 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 let me see what he's saying. So much of African mythology and ancient history has been hidden to us because what's happened is that through enslavement and colonization, we have a view of the continent of Africa that is completely false, particularly its history and its rich culture. I think you have a completely, because first of all, slavery happened in Africa before Europeans entered it, just as the first thing. Now, I would agree with you that it's a shame that in school, for example, we don't study much of African culture, African history, and I think that should very much be corrected, which is why I'm working with an African YouTuber to create a series on African myths, but also African history on this very channel. So that is in fact the only thing, I don't know if it's been hidden, the way you're pointing it out sounds like a conspiracy, but it is true that unfortunately we don't study as much of Africa, which is very interesting, as we probably should. With that being said, let's continue Wakanda. We can't just look at the Greeks and Romans in isolation. They are people of the Mediterranean. They trade, speak to, interrelate with the Africans as the Africans do with them. So we have to question why we even call this stuff just Greek and Roman mythology. It's got you know, much wider connotations across the network of that entire region. Yeah, this guy's an absolute joke. <laughs> I'm sorry, 
but that's how it is. I'm not supposed to call the Roman Empire the Roman Empire. Am I supposed to say what, the Wakanda Empire? Am I supposed to say, oh, this is the international, intercontinental? What am I supposed to say? And are you also trying to say then that if they are so connected and African history is also European history? I mean, be careful where you go with this statement. You're trying to say that the we shouldn't say Romans and Greeks because they were so connected and so they were so connected to Africa that it should be seen as a one thing. But on the other side then, uh, you need to be careful because you're going to upset people who instead want to have their own independence when it comes to African history and then you, what are you going to do? You're going to tell them, no, you shouldn't really say that that's African history, that's not black history, it's all one thing, yeah, they're not going to like that. So what you're saying is absolutely political and of course it's one-sided because you would never tell an African, well, you shouldn't really say that that's African history, you should say it's also European because it's connected to the Mediterranean, you're never going to say that. You're only going to say it on the European side, that's what you're going to do. In the movie, there's this idea of the astral plane, which is that you can communicate with your ancestors. And, you know, ancestor worship is a, a, an enormous part of both Greek and Roman culture. The old had very high status in ancient societies because they were the font of knowledge. The Romans actually would take death masks of their ancestors, clay versions of them, and then at certain festivals, they would wear the masks of their ancestors and they would parade through the streets in them. That doesn't make it an African thing. It, it just makes it something common. In fact, they could unite us in the sense that, oh look, so African people had a cult for their ancestors, so did the Romans, so did the Greeks, so did the freaking Japanese, that it's all African mythology or African thought. <laughs> It would be like saying, look, Africans believe that there is, I don't know, a, a life after death or that there are gods. Oh, well, then it, it must be because of the Africans that Romans thought that there were gods. Now, it's something that developed independently and it's in fact a common denominator among many cultures, including cultures that there is not a chance in heaven and hell that they ever interacted. And yet, they believed in God. They often had a belief towards uh, ancestors. Your point is completely mute. I love it that he takes a mask at the end and that becomes his character. And even though he uses it in a negative way, for him it empowers him and that's his connection uh, with his ancestors. So even if he's using it in a negative way, that's fine as long as he's empowered. Even the vocabulary choice, I think, I'm done with this prof professor, I'm gonna put it in quotes, professor, here, <laughs> because I just can't stand it. I just cannot stand this any longer. So, having gone through all of this with you, it seems like there is a part two. So if you want to see me debunk part two of this, of this video series, let me know in the comments. And as always, don't be racist like this guy was, like the attitude demonstrated by this guy. Be open-minded and keep politics away from history mythology and culture. Thank you very much for watching Noble Ones and remember the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.